In this video, I'll discuss the problems with the CAPM, and then I'll show you a few market anomalies. Next, I'll introduce the Fama and French 3 factor and the Carhartt 4 factor models. So let's get going. There are a lot of well known problems with the CAPM. I'll just mention a few of the most prominent ones here. First, as you might remember from the last video, we use historical data to estimate betas. We then use those betas to calculate expected returns and see how much explanatory power the CAPM has. The problem is that we're using the S&P 500 index as our measure of the overall market. When we say the market though, we're referring to the entire market, not just the US stock market. There's all kinds of other assets that are not adequately accounted for, like commodities, real estate, stamps, and coins. Because we can't accurately capture the market that includes all of those securities or assets in a single measure, we can't ever know whether the CAPM is able to accurately predict stock returns. This catch-22 is referred to as Roll's Critique after the famous financial economist Richard Roll who discovered it or wrote about it in the 1980s. Essentially, we can't ever identify the complete market and therefore we can't ever know if the CAPM is the perfect predictor model. Next, it's well known that historically low betas have higher returns than predicted by the CAPM and higher beta stocks have lower returns than predicted by the CAPM. There are several possible explanations for this, although one of the best explanations I've seen for this anomaly is that some institutional investors, like mutual funds, are not allowed to hold assets like junk bonds. Therefore, they overinvest in high beta stocks, thus pushing the price up and the future returns on those stocks down. So that explains this side of the chart. This is the assessment of both Black, Jensen, and Scholes 1972, which came out right after the CAPM was developed. And then there's also a paper called Betting Against Beta, developed by Frazzini and Peterson and published in 2014. Uh, if you want to see that analysis uh, in more detail, please just ask. I can provide links, and I've listed uh, at least one of these in our references section for this chapter. Next, most investors are not able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate or short securities. This means that there's market friction and these investors are less likely to be able to profit on valuable information. These frictions make the market less efficient and less able to price in new information. Next, we're assuming that beta is constant from one period to the next. However, a stock's beta can change dramatically, especially if the firm is changing its operations or there's some crisis occurring in the real world, like a coronavirus outbreak. This should be fairly obvious, but the historical beta might not be the future beta. In other words, we're using historical data that might not reflect the firm's future. Maybe the firm changes from a camera company into a blockchain company or a drug company. And then finally, the beta might not be the only measure of risk that's priced. There could be other risk factors besides market risk or undiversifiable risk that are factored into the share price. With all of the problems the CAPM has, it's understandable for someone to believe there might be a way for some securities with specific characteristics to outperform other securities. When we find a security's return outperforms or underperforms the expected return calculated using the CAPM, potentially we have what's called a market anomaly. We find market anomalies when securities with a specific characteristic consistently have an alpha that's statistically significantly different from zero. For example, the book to market anomaly is one of the most well-known anomalies. This anomaly refers to the fact that stocks with a high book to market value of equity outperform stocks with a low book equity divided by market value of equity once we control for beta. The size anomaly is another popular anomaly. This refers to the fact that small cap stocks outperform large cap stocks. And we calculate that using the natural log of total market cap. There's also other 
anomalies out there, like the momentum anomaly. The momentum anomaly refers to the fact that stocks that have outperformed the market for the last six months will continue to outperform the market. Uh, there's also an asset growth anomaly that says that the firms in the highest decile of total asset growth underperform the market in the future. We've mentioned the liquidity anomaly to some extent in this class, but the liquidity anomaly is another well-known one, and it refers to the fact that illiquid stocks outperform liquid stocks. In fact, uh, these are just some of the most popular. There are well in excess of 130 different anomalies that have been noted in some of the top finance journals in the last 40 years. Uh, let's take a, a deeper dive into the liquidity anomaly just to understand what we're talking about here. So you should remember that liquidity refers to the ease with which an asset can be sold at a fair market value. Now, because the trading costs are higher for illiquid stocks, investors should demand more before they hold these securities. This is the basic idea behind the illiquidity premium. We refer to the illiquidity premium using the bid-ask spread. Now, in their 1986 paper, Amahud and Mendelssohn find that there's a positive relationship between bid-ask spread and stock returns. Now, if the CAPM were a perfect predictor or a perfect prediction model of excess stock returns, we wouldn't find this. But in this case, we do. Essentially, if we sort stocks based on their bid-ask spread, what we find is that the stocks that have the higher bid-ask spread have the higher return. So I took this graphic from Amahud and Mendelssohn's 1986 paper, and it plots the average monthly return on the y-axis and the bid-ask spread as a percentage of share price on the x-axis. Obviously, you can see a positive relationship between these two. This finding has been confirmed numerous times over the years and remains one of the more enduring market anomalies. So if there's problems with the CAPM and anomalies exist, what can we do about it? Well, the answer is to develop additional models. One class of models that have been developed are called arbitrage pricing theory models, or APT models for short. These models take the cap M and then add one or more risk factors and then regress the excess return of the stock on all of those risk factors. Now, I won't ask you to do this in an introductory course, but you should at least know something about APT models or the fact that APT models exist. Now, the two most prominent models uh, or APT models that you should know about are the Fama French three-factor model and the Carhartt four-factor model. Uh, so let me dive into the three-factor model, and I'll briefly touch on the four-factor model at, at the end. So the Fama and French three-factor model relies on the fact that book to market and size are both related to stock returns and could be risk factors. In other words, book to market and size are both priced into the share price of a stock. This model adds both a book to market factor and a size factor to the cap M. And the way the researchers do this is as follows. So what they do is they take the entire stock market and they sort that market into six categories based on book to market value and market capitalization. So the top 50 largest stocks by market cap go into these three portfolios. The smallest stocks go into these three portfolios. Uh, they sort based on book to market value. So the firms that have the highest book equity or uh, value of equity on their balance sheet for their, uh, their stock divided by market value of equity uh, those will go into these two portfolios and the securities that have the lowest book market book to market value will go into these two portfolios. Uh, so lowest 30%, medium 40%, and then highest 30% of stocks. And then they use this formula to calculate a size factor and a book to market factor. So this SMB or small minus big this is the size factor for the Fama and French three-factor model. Essentially, the authors take the, the small stocks or the, the returns on the small stocks and they subtract from that the returns on the big stocks or the, the high market cap stocks. 
and then they take they create a high minus low factor which is their essentially book to market factor and there they're taking the high book to market stocks returns and subtracting from that the low book to market stock returns and they get their factor so what they're coming up with is something like this and uh, before I touch on the model, I should mention the, the authors here because they're kind of famous. Uh, the creators of this, this Fama and Furnished three-factor model are uh, two men by the name of Eugene Fama and Kenneth French. Uh, now, Eugene Fama is known as the father of modern finance, and he's won the Nobel Prize in economics for his contributions to the field. This Fama French three-factor model is one of several contributions of his. Uh, we'll talk about market efficiency later on. Uh, that was part of, I believe, his doctoral dissert dissertation. Uh, now, the Fahman French three-factor model takes the factors we just talked about and adds them to the CAPM. So this first part of the uh, testable model is just the CAPM, or the regression form of the CAPM. And then we add in the, the SMB and the HML factor. Uh, so this SMB is our size factor. This HML is our high minus low book to market factor. I wanted to show you just what happens when you include two additional risk factors in your regression model. So here we're not doing simple linear regression. Now we're using multilinear regression. So we have three X variables. So here we're still using 60 months worth of data, but now in addition to the market risk premium, we're also including the small minus big factor and the high minus low factor. And our stock in this case is Dunkin' Donuts. And I have here the excess return on Dunkin'. And when I regress our excess return on Dunkin' on these three variables, the market risk premium, size minus big, and high minus low, what you can see here is that we get a much higher R squared than we did in either of our other examples. So just for reference, I believe our R squared for the Microsoft example was 0.28, and our R squared for the uh, Apple example uh, for Apple was 0.27, and our R squared was 0.32 for our Boeing example. So, as you can see, including additional factors allows us to account for far more of the volatility of these excess returns in a given stock. So, there's a benefit to including these two factors. In other words, uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that these APT models do a much better job of explaining the variation in our dependent variable. This Fama, French, or Fama and French three-factor model this is one of many APT models. I mean, there's many different four-factor or five-factor models out there now. Uh, however, the Fama and French three-factor model, this is really seen as the gold standard. If you're not going to use the CAPM, you're going to probably use the, the Fama French three-factor model. There is, however, another model out there that's very prominent, and it's called the Carhartt model. And in that model, we add a fourth factor, a momentum factor and regress our excess returns on a given stock or a given uh, portfolio on those four factors. And the momentum factor allows us to account for the fact that uh, there might be a, a benefit to being exposed to momentum risk. All right, so let's wrap up. I've mentioned that there are many problems with the CAPM. Uh, the big ones being that we can't perfectly quantify the market risk premium, and therefore we can't ever know if the CAPM is a good model or not. Uh, obviously, there's going to be market frictions in the real world that we're assuming when we use the CAPM don't exist. And then finally, when we estimate betas, we're estimating them based on historical data, which is pro possibly not the best solution since we're, we're expecting historical data to predict future data, which it doesn't always do. Next, we talked about market anomalies, and market anomalies just involve stocks with one characteristic outperforming or underperforming what they were expected to based on our model of the real world. In most cases, that's going to be the CAPM or the Fama French three-factor model.
Uh, there are all kinds of market anomalies, the book to market, asset growth, size, momentum, liquidity. I mentioned all of those. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a class of models that have developed since CAPM has been found to not be a, a perfect model uh, called APT models or arbitrage pricing theory models. Uh, two of the most common or most prominent models in that area or that genre of model are the Fama and French three-factor model and the Carhart four-factor model. Although there are many others, I mean, Fama and French, just as a side note, they do have a five-factor model, but that's well beyond the scope of this course. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. I've left some of the papers that were used to develop some of the techniques that we talked about in our references slide. So feel free to browse those papers to your heart's content, and I will see you on the next video.